You could have just been a completely passive investor and killed it over the last 10 years, and yeah. you might have mistaken your luck for skill. And I think that's not going to be possible over the next 10 years, where if you're going to make money in markets, it's going to be because you were good at it, not yeah. because you randomly allocated to a bunch of random shit that was supported by low rates and VC hype. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 47 of the Atlas Pod. I am Tobias. What's up, guys? I'm Shabal. All right, man. Final episode of the year. We got to do the 2023 recap and the 2024 predictions episode. But before we dive into that, we've got some major announcements. Probably the biggest announcement in the history of the company so far. So as you guys are aware, we've been working on several products here at Atlas. We've been testing them in beta. And as of today, by certainly by the time that you guys are watching this, our first products are live and on the market. So we have two products. One is Atlas Private Client, and that is an experience for ultra high net worth individuals, their families, athletes, entertainers, Henry's who are high income, but not rich yet folks. And that is an advisor led experience. So if you are interested in that, you can go to atlasfinancial.com. Brand new website is also launched. You can hit get started. And we are now booking meetings with Atlas advisors in January of next year. We're really excited about that. And then we also launched the Atlas mobile app. We'll throw the link up uh, in the description. That's for anybody who wants to uh, invest alongside Cheval and myself. We lead the investment team here at Atlas and that product is solely for providing world-class investment management to all of you. Um, so we have five uh, actively managed equity products that are live in there. We have one actively managed fixed income product and then we have a high yield cash product. And uh, as you guys are about to hear, you know, 2023 was an amazing year from an investment perspective and we're really fired up about providing world-class returns and experience to everybody in 2024. So those products are live. It's been a huge labor of love. It's been a long time coming. Couldn't be more excited to bring this into the world. Absolutely, man. Yeah, it's been it's been a long time coming. A lot of work went into the portfolios, obviously, but also just the tech build out and super excited to get this in the hands of the people. It's incredible, man. It truly is. And then, of course, you know, on the content side too, like, you know, just taking a moment and, and looking back on the year, this is 47 episodes that we've done in, you know, 52 week year, right? And we didn't launch the pod until February. So right. we've taken, I think, one week off for, for Thanksgiving. And other than that, we've hit every single week of this year. So just from a consistency and hopefully a quality perspective, you know, I think we've we've delivered above and beyond certainly my expectations. Most podcasts don't make it beyond episode three. We're on episode 47 in year one. We're hitting 300,000 downloads on YouTube alone, plus many hundreds of thousands more across YouTube shorts, Instagram, TikTok, all the other platforms. Uh, and I think we're, we're excited about launching content on, on LinkedIn in, in 2024, in addition to the written content that you know, you've worked so hard on and putting that uh, out into the world in 2024 as well. So it's been a lot of fun. I think, I think you know, for, from my perspective, um, one of the things that is an upside surprise in terms of like how much I enjoy doing this show with you every single week. It's just been incredible. For sure. I mean, it's definitely, definitely one of the highlights of the, of the week, every week when we get out here. <laughs> Uh, and, and in app, we have, we're going to have some special content that probably is not going to be available on YouTube as quickly. So, you know, there, there's a unique experience there as well. Um, we're definitely in the top 1% of consistency in terms of podcasts. I actually just read that um, Seth Godin, who, who's a pretty uh, acclaimed figure and, and author, will do anyone's podcast as long as it's their 100th episode. <laughs> kind of like rewarding <laughs> the consistency there um, just goes to show how, how few make it. But you know, there, there's plenty to talk about in the markets and I'm pretty excited about what we're building. So yeah, this, this is always a fun way to, to cap the week. That's awesome. All right, let's dive into, uh, into 2023 and a recap on the predictions that I had laid out in the beginning of 2023, how we did. So the first prediction for 2023 was that generative AI sets a new record for venture capital dollars raised in a single year. So I went and I pulled the data for this. It looks like 2023 in terms of AI VC dollars invested into the space is going to come in at just over $50 billion. That is not going to be a record, but directionally, I'll give myself credit that I was definitely on the right path here. The interesting thing is that 2021 
AI, according to this article anyway, raised 78.5 billion. So this is actually not even a record for AI. And then the record in terms of total venture dollars invested into a particular space was crypto in 2021, uh, which was 121.5. But still this year obviously was the year of AI. Over one in four venture dollars invested in totality went into AI companies. Another uh, prediction that I had made associated with AI was that open AI would lead the way and that it would achieve a north of $75 billion valuation as of this recording. OpenAI is closing the round that they've been, they've been working on for the last few months at an $86 billion valuation. So actually higher than the 75 I predicted. But what did you think about this year as it relates to VC and, and AI? And do you think this continues in 2024? Yeah, I think I think it's just getting started uh, in the private markets. Definitely, definitely will continue. And I'll say the prediction was a good one, obviously. Um, we're not going to do the letter grades like we did on the halftime report, but this is definitely this definitely would be up there. And I think the piece that uh, may be missing is a lot of money uh, flowed into AI in the public markets. So yeah. this was one of the unique investment themes where there was an ability to access this through public markets as well. Typically, when you see you know a new uh, venture sector emerge and there's a lot of hype behind it. The only way to access those companies is through private markets, uh, which right. you know inevitably means most people won't be able to access them. Here, we've seen Nvidia cross the trillion-dollar threshold. Obviously, Microsoft and others have gained tremendously from the AI hype. Honestly, any tech company that isn't talking about AI is probably getting hammered in the public market. So, I think the 50 billion may not be like the the record number for dollars raised, even for AI itself. But I think. If you factor in some of the public market flows, uh, it's definitely it's definitely up there. Yeah, I think that's a, a crucial point because one of the observations that I've had over the course of the year, and this is all moving so fast, right? I mean, like ChatGPT really only launched in November of last year, so we're 13 months into this as a space. Um, I did not expect for as much of the value capture that I've so far seen happening in AI to be occurring at those top seven. And if you wanted to look at whether or not there was a justification for the Magnificent Seven and the performance that they had in 2023, I think that if you look, if you just circle AI, it's fully justified because of how much value capture has occurred at Microsoft, at Google, at Facebook, at Amazon, and then for what's going to occur uh, you know, at Tesla and at Apple, and then obviously you throw Nvidia in there. So one of the things that I would be sort of interested to see in 2024 is if this can actually work its way down into the startup ecosystem, where startups aren't just raising venture capital dollars based on the hype train, but they're actually able to build AI-oriented products that generate revenue and ideally profits, right? Because as I'm seeing right now, I think that the 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 major um, component of value capture is this data moat. So in other words, no matter what application you want to inject AI into, if you have a large user base, you're going to be able to come up with a better customer facing AI feature or application by, by harvesting that data. So like, let's just say you wanted to build some sort of travel AI travel app, the kayaks of the world, the, you know, Expedia's of the world, they're just better positioned to do that by harvesting all of that data than a company who's starting from scratch that needs to go out and figure out how to, how to get that data. And they're not gonna have the proprietary access to it that the big companies do. So I'm a big proponent of distribution over product, but I think so far what I've seen in AI is that distribution actually makes the product better. And that's rare, you know, and the reason why is just because like if you have 100 million users on your on your product already, you're going to be able to get that data and turn it into a better LLM that then can turn into a better customer facing uh, application. And so I'm not sure that AI startups are going to be able to really fight the fight against the the incumbents that, you know, are, are just better positioned. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, the we've spoken about the importance of the proprietary data and yeah. the self-reinforcing models. Like you need to have that ability to uh, react to uh, user feedback and continuously improve your models. Like that, that's gonna be kind of who wins on that uh, infrastructure layer. And I think, you know, there, we're, we're, not fully, we're not fully there yet with the AI story, right? So the fir there's like multiple layers of how this kind of technology will evolve, right? You imagine on kind of the most foundational level, it's not actually the foundational models, it's the cloud computing uh, technology, it's the semis, it's the hardware. So like that is like fairly well established at this point or we're getting there. Um, and then the second layer is like the foundational models that you're talking about um, and kind of that, that, data, that data layer. 
And then on top of that, which is where we really haven't even scratched the surface, is where all of the apps will be built. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where, where the runway remains. And I think there's an opportunity to see a lot of value capture uh, beyond kind of the big companies that are, that are operating in those first two layers. And I, w- I won't get into the predictions yet. I won't jump the gun on that. But I think, I think there's a lot more to come on that. All right. Interesting. All right. So moving to 2023 prediction number two, uh, equity markets outperform and finish the year up 15% or more. As of the time of this recording, the S&P 500 is up 25% on the year. So this prediction was a home run. And obviously, we captured a lot of that value in our portfolios. And we had a great year from an investing perspective. I won't say the exact numbers for legal and compliance reasons. But if you were a part of the beta, you know, you performed better than the benchmark this year. Um, So kudos to you and the rest of the team for, for doing that. Um, So what I mean, for me, like when I think about why 2023 was a great year for equity markets, I think there's really two things. One is people were overly bearish as it relates to uh, the economy. Everyone expected there to be a not only a recession, but like a very deep recession uh, that looked in some cases for most people's prediction somewhere around what we experienced in 2008, 2009. And that was just way too bearish. Um, And then two, you know, the inflation expectations that we had coming into this year and the rapid descent that I had predicted uh, inflation to to occur, meaning like interest rates were were going to go up and inflation was going to go down and that was going to happen much faster than people had anticipated. And that's exactly what we got. I mean, as of this week, we have core PCE at 1.87%. So, you know, if the Fed is looking at that 2% benchmark from an inflation standpoint, it seems that we are now below there. And as we talked about on last week's episode, the Fed pivot is already in and now we're pricing in six cuts in 2024. So this year was an unbelievable year for those two reasons as it relates to equity markets. But the majority of that value capture occurred in relatively small group of stocks, you know, the Magnificent Seven being being like you know, the vast majority of gains on NASDAQ. So how do you think that this this sort of shaped up in 2023 and looking into 2024, are we expecting the same thing to happen? Well, I, lo- I love predictions like this because these are the easiest ones to to be proven right or wrong on. Yeah. Uh, and, and this one was obviously a, a success, uh, 25% versus 15% prediction. And it wasn't, it wasn't uh, obvious at all points throughout the year, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, there was there was thoughts in the beginning of the year that we were going to be facing a deep recession. Of course, I've harped on the fact that Papa Powell himself has has made those uh, predictions along with his uh, federal uh, along with the rest of the Fed. So it wasn't like this was an obvious call at the beginning of the year. Then we had the whole SVB crisis uh, and oh regional God. banking crisis that occurred, um, and people were worried about contagion. So you know, just to just to say, like pat on the back, this wasn't this wasn't a slam dunk in the beginning of the year, though though it turned out to be towards the end of the year. Uh, I think. You know, once again, I won't I won't go too far into what I expect for for next year, but it's obvious when you see that, you know, majority of the returns being captured by the Magnificent Seven, as they're being called, in order to sustain this kind of rally going into 2024, you're going to need to see some dispersion. Uh, and I think there's opportunities out there uh, for uh, for alpha generating stocks. But I think, you know, and and I don't want and once again, I don't want to go too far into this, but I think the the broader point that that I've seen is if you're if you're thinking that the regime going forward is going to mirror the regime that we had over the last 10 to 15 years, then you're going to be caught flat-footed. You're going to be caught yeah. off guard. The opportunity to pick stocks, rebalance your portfolio, and basically uh, participate in active management, whether that's yourself or whether that's with professionals, uh, is significantly higher and will yield significantly higher rewards uh, over the coming years than it has in the past. Just looking at uh, returns for kind of passive versus active over the last three years, they have dwarfed returns of passive versus active in the preceding three years, just because the entire market was being supported by this low rate environment. And that's clearly not going to happen going forward. So I think, you know, there there is significant uh, value to be had by active managers uh, and kind of a more active approach uh, in, in managing your portfolio. Yep. All right, moving to prediction number three, also one that I think we absolutely nailed. Crypto not only survives, but thrives. Um, Look, I mean, coming into 2023, I think there was a lot of people that believed that from a regulatory standpoint, there was people very, very high up, you know, at the SEC that wanted to not only uh, sort of cripple crypto, but totally eradicate it, make it so that, you know, crypto was not a legal thing to be invested in or to operate a business with uh, in in the United States. And it was scary. I mean, 2022, when we talk about a crypto winner, we had gone from an environment in 2021 where 
altcoins were up thousands of percent, NFTs, JPEGs, like all this craziness was happening. And in 2022, you know, a lot of the volume and sort of the tertiary stuff that's far out on the risk curve went down 99%, you know what I mean? Like you had companies like OpenSea that went from doing billions of dollars a day in total traded volume to doing like a few thousand dollars a day in total traded volume. Yet Bitcoin is up whatever 200 and something percent on, on the year. Um, as we go into 2024, you know, we're, I think we're really well positioned to see institutional adoption of this and crypto does not only survive, but thrives. However, I do think that it has matured over 2023. We've seen less until very recently, we've seen less of the speculation on, you know, the doge coins of the world and things that have no real inherent value and more of a focus on what I think, you know, the, the real sort of a critical component of crypto investing and building on the blockchain is, which is utilizing these technologies to actually do things to provide utility to users, or in the case of Bitcoin, understanding that this is a religion, it's a cult. People, people whether or not you believe it's a store of value, it's given you every reason in the world to not exist, and it still does. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's one of those situations where if you can't beat them, you got to join them. Yeah, I love, love this prediction. Uh, those who, who know me well know uh, I've, I've been a big fan of crypto for many years. Um, the, the market has just been on fire <laughs> these last few weeks as the hype towards uh, Bitcoin ETF uh, launch mounts. Uh, you've seen coins like Solana up, I think, like 900% year to date. Um, okay. But behind, behind the price action is the point that you alluded to, that there's actual activity occurring. Uh, we've seen a lot of funds flow into the market. We've seen activity on decentralized exchanges really spike up over the last few months. And, you know, there's kudos, kudos to the folks who continue building uh, technologies in the face of the crypto winter. It, it can be quite deflating when you have a year like 2021, where it seemed like crypto was just on the cusp of falling into the mainstream. And then 2022, you have a bunch of negative headlines. And then, you know, every, one by one, every single one of the folks in crypto who, who were revered at one point uh, from CZ to SBF right. to Suzu with Three Arrows Capital, like every single one of uh, Do Kwan, every single one of these guys who were kind of like the deities of crypto uh, turned out to be frauds or, or were scamming in one regard or another. Um, yet the space uh, thrived and survived because the underlying technology and the promise of it is just so great. And I think the idea of the government banning crypto and Bitcoin specifically just makes it stronger. And right. it's actually not even possible to ban Bitcoin. That's the whole point of it. It's permissionless. It's uncensorable. Uh, it's hard money. So I, I love that prediction. And, and I think 2024 will, will yield the same for crypto. Yeah, I think what you just said on the deities of crypto all turning out to be you know, either frauds <laughs> or criminals or whatever, and the space continuing to thrive in the face of that is really all you need to know. Like if I would just give you the headlines of Three Hours Capital, of FTX, of Luna, uh, you know, all the other ones, like the Celsius is, the BlockFi is, like just these high profile, uh, like really just, just disastrous crashes, you know, in the most spectacular fashion. And I would have asked you to, to predict where Bitcoin would be trading. You probably would have said like, I don't know, a few hundred dollars. And yet it's trading like north of 40,000 as of this recording. So. That, that to me, sometimes you just need to see the forest through the trees and just understand that there is a much larger secular uh, trend that, that's playing out and that this doesn't happen in the time frames that we want it to, whether that's weeks, months, or years. It happens in decades, and this seems to be one of those things that is not going to slow down no matter who is trying to get in its way up to and including the federal government. So. Uh, love this prediction. Glad that things have worked out in 23. Looking forward to 2024. Um, okay, so this one, this one was uh, a prediction that looked good in the beginning and then has lost a lot of steam late in 2023. TikTok gets banned in the U.S. as Chinese-American relations continue to deteriorate. I am, I, look, I'm a vocal critic of TikTok. I think that it does a material detrimental and negative harm to specifically young people that use it. I think that there's very little utility associated with being an avid TikTok user. Um, although I'm also a free speech purist and like I think that things should be out there. And one of the things that came up in, in the early parts of 2023 when 
uh, the CEO got dragged in front of Congress was like, is this actually Chinese spyware? And I don't think that we have a conclusive answer to that yet, but the, I guess like the sense of urgency to kind of like get TikTok off the app store and out of Google Play seems to have died down. So I gotta say, I got this prediction mostly wrong, although I do think that it is officially banned on all federal devices, uh, on all military devices, and on like over 14 or 15 college campuses, and in the great state of Montana, no TikTok. But by and large, I think that you know, TikTok continues to survive and to a certain degree thrive, uh, you know, at least for the retail users. TikTok is one of those things where you know, the adults in the room look at it and they're like, this is terrible, we don't want this, and then there's just so much demand. Um, and by nature of the app, like it's meant to be addictive. It's meant to be an app that you don't get off. So, you know, the, obviously the people who use it are like, no, we, <laughs> we want this. Um, the ban in, ban in the federal devices uh, definitely makes the prediction uh, directionally correct. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. These are, these are tough things like to, to go down the road of just like banning apps outright, especially when there are fractured relationships between the U.S. and China. Uh, it's, a tough, it's a tough decision to make. I do know that apps like TikTok and just social media in general have definitely altered the course of our society um, materially. And, and I just think like the development uh, and the behavioral patterns of humans, like everyone has had this experience where, you know, like if you're, I don't know, if you, re if you watch a movie late night or you're playing a video game late night and you go to, you go to sleep and you close your eyes and like you'll see the movie and you're still playing in your head yeah. or you'll see the video game and you'll like kind of be thinking about it. And imagine you're doing that like for eight hours a day using these apps. Like it, it definitely affects people's attention spans. Uh, you know, nobody's sitting there and watching like, you know, two, three hour podcast. I mean, ours may fly in the face of that, but like typically <laughs> like you, you want your content served to you in like bite-sized pieces. And I think the proliferation of these apps has definitely like shortened the human attention span. It remains to be seen whether... Uh, that ends up being a net positive or not in the long run, but it definitely doesn't appear well, that way right now. I can tell you, after becoming a parent, you know, Kim is is an adamant no screen time for rain for the first two years. Like he's not allowed to watch TV. He doesn't have an iPad. She won't let me be on the phone anywhere near him, just because you know she's read a bunch of stuff that says developmentally, if the kids start to you know, get addicted to whatever it is, even Coco Melon and some of the stuff that's developed specifically for kids, that it like slows down the natural and organic development of your brain. And like the thing that you should be doing is reading books to them and having conversations. Even if like they can't respond yet, this is the developmental stages that they need to get through. And I think so many parents end up just utilizing, whether it's TikTok, whether it's YouTube Kids, or you know some of these TV shows, they use it as like a, a reprieve or respite just to, to not have to be parenting their child when of course that's just like a terrible reason to allow your kid to use it. I think people need to fundamentally get back to the question of like, is this in the best interest of my kid? And when I look at all the stuff that you know my teenage and I guess she's now like in her 20s or whatever, her sister is like looking out on TikTok all day. It's not anything positive, right? So not to say that Instagram or you know Twitter or any of these things are, are necessarily better, but I do feel like there's a lot more negative content on TikTok and I'm hopeful that Rain won't be addicted to it and I'm certainly not gonna not gonna allow him to use it if I can, if I have anything to say about it, like, you know, no TikTok for you. But uh, so far, it hasn't been officially banned. So I guess we have to put this one in like the somewhat right category. Yeah. All right. Another prediction. Uh, Ron DeSantis becomes the clear presidential front runner in the American presidential race as the youth of America moves to the right. Not a good prediction. You know, I think as of today, DeSantis is kind of like number three. I'll say this. The thing that I got really wrong about this prediction is I didn't think that Trump was coming back into the race. Like, I thought that with all of the legal issues that he's facing, it would be impossible for him to mount a presidential campaign. And that's just me underestimating really just like the gall 
of Trump. You know, like he could be facing 90 something criminal charges. And to him, it's just another day at the office. It's right back to the campaign trail. I just didn't think that somebody would have that audacity. And once he entered the race, you know, DeSantis's popularity plummeted. So not looking like this was a very good prediction. Yeah, that that was a that was definitely a, a wrinkle in the prediction. I mean, DeSantis also, though, like independently of Trump, he just simply fumbled the bag uh, yeah. as a politician in this country, whether you like it or not. It's not all about your track record. It's not all about the facts. It's, it, it is also about your charisma, your public persona. Can you kiss the babies? Can you shake the hands? And Ron DeSantis simply was unable to do that effectively. Um, I, think the, I think the idea of moving further right, kind of the youth of the country moving further right, um, I mean, it's not proven out yet because we haven't had the election yet, but I think there's something to that. I think people have you know, felt some pushback from you know, the world kind of swings in these directions. And I think there has been a swing that's gone too far in the direction of, you know, cancel culture and things like that. So I think, you know, there, there is a bit of a pullback there. So I don't know if that, if I can say the entire prediction was totally wrong. Obviously the Ron DeSantis piece uh, didn't prove out, but I think there's something to that, to the second part of that prediction. Yeah. I mean, again, like this is just part of my own natural, like, maturation of going from being a 20 something year old person that didn't really think too much about things like safety living in new york city to being a father in my mid 30s now people just want an area where you can send your kids to a great school you can get a decent house um, and for it to be safe and clean and unfortunately like we live in los angeles and whether you look at los angeles or san francisco or portland or seattle like it's not safe. Things, it's not it's safe. Not clean. safe, right? It's not safe and it's not <laughs> clean. And I get that there are like real deep human issues associated with this, empathy issues, morality issues. But at the end of the day, like if you're going to be charging the prices that it, it costs to live in any of these cities on the West Coast, you know, I think that safety needs to come guaranteed, and and that's not the case. And so, what do you see? You see a max exodus of people out of these cities to places like Nashville, Tennessee, to Dallas, Texas, to Austin, to Denver, to Miami, places where, you know, there's more progressive social ideologies, but within, you know, a, a state that enforces law and order. And that's kind of like what, what, the, what the crux of the prediction was, is that this sort of just hits a, a boiling point where people do not want to live in sanctuary cities. They don't want to go out in the street and have, uh, you know, homeless encampments in their front yard and on their doorstep of their multi-million dollar house or condo. Um, and they don't want to have to subject their kids to some of this radical, you know, ideology uh, associated with like gender issues and stuff like that when they're very early on in their life. Uh, at school. So that was what I think. It, I think, you know, I believe that more today than I did in the beginning of 2023. So we'll see how the election turns out. But uh, I think that part of the of the prediction is going to end up being accurate. Yep. All right. So uh, this was a bonus. This was the last one. Central C breaks through to the mainstream. I don't know. Central C didn't really have a great year. I mean, I think British. I don't know, man. He, he came. In there general. were some dude. He was out there. He was out there a little bit. Um, I feel like he he didn't make that final push into the mainstream yeah i know i feel like british hip-hop is probably more popular at the end of 2023 than it was at the beginning but central c is still relatively unknown he had an opportunity i mean drake tried to put him on on deck to really break through but so far it this year was basically just the old school guys doing it all over again i think like drake had the top album of the year again uh i don't know really who else you know like it just feels like hip-hop is still like just drake's territory yeah travis travis scott travis Travis scott Scott came back um yeah i don't know i think central c he was right there maybe next year will be his year but you know i think relatively he's still at a much higher level of fame than before uh and just like looking at the six the six predictions i guess if you count the bonus like pretty pretty solid and i would say on the ones that matter the most i would say the ones that matter the most like the equity markets, I think crypto, if you had exposure, you you made a lot of money. AI, obviously, like those are probably the bigger three. Um, the TikTok and Central C are kind of like more uh, yeah. auxiliary. Ron DeSantis, um, you know, can't can't defend you on the DeSantis piece of that. But like <laughs> other otherwise, a pretty, pretty solid uh, docket of predictions, I would say. All right, let's hit the 2024 predictions. Um, my first prediction for 2024 is that equity markets revert to a historical performance of around 10% and that the breadth widens. So I don't think that equity markets are going to perform as well in 2024 as they did in 2023. A couple of things there. One, expectations are just much higher. 
So as we record this podcast, there's an expectations for a total of like six rate cuts in 2024. Um, more people are getting long. We started to see the, the sort of asset rotation take place at the end of Q3. That's definitely progressed through Q4. As we finish up this week, I think it's the eighth or ninth consecutive week in a row uh, of, of positive gains on both the S&P and NASDAQ. So you know, things are definitely going to have a much higher bar as it relates to expectations. And of course, performance isn't just about absolute performance. It's about performance relative to expectations. So as expectations go up, it becomes harder and harder for stocks or any asset class relative to those expectations to, to outperform. Um, but there are fundamental improvements that I want to point out. So one thing that was uh, a, a really big um, sort of sort of clue that we're in the right stage of, of the rebound here is that median net ARR, so annual recurring revenue for software, had its first positive quarter since Q2 of 21 in Q3 of 23. So I'll put this chart up on the screen. But as you can see, in Q2 of 21, this peaked at 71%. So this is new clients that are coming on to any SaaS company's um, product was generating net new ARR of, of up 71%. And then the interesting thing here is that it then declined for seven quarters in a row, reaching the trough in Q1 of 2023 at down 27%. And then in Q2, it was down 10%. And then in Q3, it was up 2%. So that's nine quarters exactly from its peak of, of 71% to the trough to then getting back above zero. And the interesting thing about that is that nine quarters is the exact amount of time that the average recession lasts. So when we think about recessions, typically we think about them as big economies. So is the United States in recession or is Europe in a recession? Is China in a recession? But you can also look at this in sort of a microcosm of an industry, in this case, SaaS. And it was a nine month, sorry, nine quarter recession in, in SaaS software. And now we've gone and we've entered the other side of it. So I think fundamentally things are much better. Um, I think expectations are higher. So it's gonna be harder to be able to make the gains that we had in 2023. That was basically just a, a better than low expectation environment. Um, but I'm predicting that markets are going to be up around 10% in 24. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, directly right. I actually I actually had uh, around eight or nine percent um, on on my bingo card for next year, but <laughs> I think 10% is is quite close. I think the the broader point is that we're we're going to be lower than we were this year in terms of the uh, the gain in markets. Few reasons for that. Um, obviously, you spoke about uh, you know kind of this rebound uh, in SaaS, uh, and I think. You know, there, there's been this idea of like a massive recession occurring, you know, obviously now people talk about soft landing, like, you know, that's become the consensus view earlier right. in the year, as we mentioned before, that wasn't the case. I think what we've seen here is actually kind of like a rolling recession where it hits different sectors at different times. And that has allowed us to avoid kind of the broader all in one massive recession. We saw it in travel in 2020 as a result of COVID. We saw it in real estate last year. We saw it in semis last year. We saw it in oil. Like all, and all of these sectors have rebounded, um, yet none of them happened at exactly the same time, which allowed us yeah. to avoid this recession. Now, going into 2024, we have valuations at not at all-time highs, but at certainly at elevated levels. And when you have valuations there, it's tough to pencil out even further multiple expansion. So that's that's one piece. And then the other reason why I think returns uh, in equity markets will be a little bit lower is we have a consensus expectation of 11% earnings growth. I think there's a few reasons why we will fall short of that, probably closer to the 7 8% year-on-year uh, -year earnings growth. One, we have avoided recession in the U.S., but in other countries, uh, they're still an ongoing recovery. China, obviously, Europe, obviously. Two, the consumer is still being challenged right now. And if there's persistent inflation, and that doesn't mean six, seven, eight percent inflation, that just means three percent, uh, yeah. three and a half percent, four percent inflation. Uh, that's going to that's going to continue to put pressure uh, on the consumer. So I think I think earnings growth is going to be a little bit a little bit lower than than what the market is uh, pricing in right now. So I would say, you know, high single digits, low double digits returns. Uh, would be uh, would be on the cards for next year, but certainly not 
the 15 to 25% range that we saw this year. Yeah, I mean, the reason why you got such a massive move this year is because the companies that have the largest market cap weightings in the index were up so much. <laughs> yeah, like the, the NVIDIAs, the Apples, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazon. And a lot of that just had to do with the AI trend and the value capture that we talked about at the top of the show. So in order for the market to perform even like just be up next year, we're going to have to see a materially widening, widening of breadth, meaning that companies that are mid and small cap companies are going to have to be up and they're going to have to be up substantially because I think there's a possibility that, you know, these, these magnificent seven kind of just have a, a sideways year um, and, and some of them may even be down. And so I went back and I looked uh, over the course of the last three years, there's only been three days that the magnificent seven stocks were all down and the markets were actually up. And all of those have occurred in the last uh, two months. So what we're seeing right now is that the, the catch up trade is on. And if you look across like FinTech space, whether it's Coinbase, the buy now, pay later stocks, like some of these things have just been making absolutely massive moves. FinTech was left for dead. Um, now FinTech is, is roaring back, right? Because it's like the, the highest correlation and leverage to, to interest rates. So we're going to have to see other sectors perform. I think that fintech can definitely do it. I think that crypto can definitely do it. The banking sector can definitely do it. Um, and then, you know, TBD on, on sort of the uh, energy and industrial stocks. But it's not going to be as simple as, you know, just sort of buy the top 10 market cap weighted stocks in NASDAQ and, you know, you're good. Um, it's going to be it's going to have to be a, a more all hands on deck approach for S&P 500, for Russell 2000 and for, for NASDAQ. So, yeah, to, it's not to say that, you know, there's not going to be opportunities. I think there's going to be a lot of alpha generating opportunities. It's going to be a professional stock pickers game for sure. Um, but yeah, just expecting a little bit of a, of a lower return than what we got this year. Absolutely. Um, I mean, look, you, you, you made a good point here. Like you can't just sit there and sit in, you know, sit in a SPY and hope you're going to, you know, receive majority of the returns uh, that equity markets produce next year. Coming back to the point that I made, like looking at it at a sector level, if you had a crystal ball and it could tell you at the beginning of 2020, which sectors are going to outperform the market and you allocate it to those the return dispersion that you would have, the difference between the market returns and what you achieved was significantly greater between 2020 and 2023 than it was between 2016, 2017, and 2020. So I believe that regime is going to uh, persist going forward and returns have to disperse. I think there's a number of sectors uh, or kind of broader broader themes that I think are attractive. We can talk about some of them, but one that comes to mind is, you know, look at look at dividend stocks. Dividend stocks uh, for us sit uh, in our recession ready theme, which I think is going to actually do quite well next year. Um, you know, these are these are stocks that have valuations that are 20, 25 percent below the market average. So, you know, if you're if you're going to expect equity markets to perform next year, then you're going to need to see some of these stocks perform well as well. And you can capture some income along the way. So I think uh, I'm actually feeling pretty good about a recession ready theme for next year. Nice. Love it. All right. Prediction number two for me. I think crypto is the best performing asset class of the year again. Look, I mean, we covered it kind of already, but here's here's the backdrop. So much negative news has happened over the course of the last two years in the crypto space. And yet this continues to progress forward at a pace that no one could have predicted. And now we're getting what I think is going to be the most material event that's happened in the history of crypto, which is the approval of a, a Bitcoin ETF and institutional dollars that flow into the space. Just look at the list of people that have filed applications for Bitcoin ETF. It's the who's who, you know, starting with like the Black Rocks, uh, the Vanguards, the Fidelities. Like when you think about the totality of dollars that are going to come into an asset class that has a fixed amount of supply, the thing that moves prices the most in the short term is liquidity. Liquidity is a function of how much available asset is, is uh, on the market. And when you don't have you know, a, a large amount of availability, that liquidity dries up and the prices go through the roof. I think that occurs. Um, there's no way for these guys to front run it, meaning that BlackRock can't be like buying Bitcoin ahead of the approval. They have to wait for it. Same thing with every, every other uh, you know, Bitcoin ETF applicant. And when the dollars get put into the ETF, again, they don't have discretion on to when to, to pull the trigger on the buys. They have to deploy that money. That's a mandate that goes into that's a mandate that goes into effect on approval. So I think you know we're we're talking about order of magnitude trillions of dollars that are going to flow into this space. 
Um, and that provides just a secular tailwind that, that I want to be a part of. I think that works for crypto mining stocks, and I think it works for, for Coinbase uh, and some of the other sort of heavily levered uh, crypto equities as well. Well, love love Coinbase. Uh, have been pretty vocal about that. Um, yeah, I, I like this prediction a lot. I think, yeah, crushed it. Um, I think the Bitcoin ETF stuff, uh, for those who haven't been following it as closely, um, it's it's almost a it's a guarantee at this point. I would say it's the the approval odds are greater than ninety percent by January tenth. Uh, that's the date that I threw out there uh, last week on the final trade. You know, all all of the issuers are just kind of going through this revision period. Uh, with the regulators changing it, you know, there's this big debate on whether uh, they will let, be allowed to do in-kind versus cash, uh, and, and it seems like it's falling on the side of the cash. But it seems like the they're going through kind of the finer points here. It's not a question of, you know, if this will get approved, it's a question of when. Um, so that, that's obviously a big catalyst for the space. Uh, for Bitcoin specifically, uh, the halving is coming up as well. Um, that, that typically uh, is uh, followed by some significant price action over the coming months and years. So I think I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Bitcoin continues its rise as the best performing asset, not of the year, but of the decade. Uh, and excited to see, you know, some of the other some of the other coins uh, progress as well, though I think in my mind and in many other investors minds, when it comes to crypto, there's Bitcoin and then there's everything else. Yeah. And then I think the, the, the key point just to drive home is that there's no way like the market, people that are that are speculating on the approval of the Bitcoin ETF, if you're an individual investor, if you're a hedge fund, whatever, you're definitely allowed to go out and buy Bitcoin ahead of that in anticipation of that approval. But the actual Bitcoin ETF operators, they can't. So so just so that we're like we're clear on the flow of funds here. Once it gets approved and once institutional dollars, especially from retirement funds like the 401ks, the IRAs, the stuff that utilize these large uh, asset managers in order to be able to manage retirement assets, once they have the ability to then allow uh, their customers to invest into, into crypto and into Bitcoin specifically, that, was money, that money flows in and it gets, it gets deployed in like a matter of hours or days and you basically still get the fall on effect. So it's not, it's not like an equity that's priced for perfection where everyone's kind of already gone ahead and bought the stock in anticipation of like a big earnings beat. This is a flow of funds trade and it's a flow of funds trade into like a very illiquid asset class relative to, to equities. And, and I just think that backdrop is, is really important. Um, okay, prediction number three here. So this one is, uh, it, it's not about markets particularly, it's just about what I, what I see happening in sort of the world. Um, college is out, trade school is in, okay? So I, a lot of stuff's been going on with like the Ivy League schools, the fiasco when the presidents of the Ivy League schools uh, appeared before Congress. Um, I looked back and, and looked at application rates for college. So college enrollment has actually been down 12% year over year. Um, I think that that continues directionally. I think that fewer people are going to college. And the reason for that is that this idea that we were all, this sort of bag of goods that we were all sold, where it's like, all right, you get good grades in school, you go to a good college, if you get out of a good college, you get a high paying job, just isn't the case for more and more people every single year. Yet on the flip side, what are we seeing? We're seeing a total dearth of talent in like the do it yourself stuff. Like where are the carpenters? Where are like the people that have, you know, like real trade skills, right? Um, and the interesting thing is that some of the MBAs, and we've talked about this a lot on the show, some of the MBAs that are graduating from the Harvards and the Stanfords and everything, they're not going to Goldman Sachs anymore and they're not going to, to Silicon Valley. They're going and buying like landscaping and plumbing companies in you know, West Virginia or whatever. I think this continues. Like if, if I was having a conversation with my brother who's a sophomore in college right now and I was like asking him what he wants to do and you know, he wants to get into finance and business. I'm like, that's awesome, you should definitely do that. And then he was asking me like, you know, if I wanted to make the most amount of money, like what do you think I should do? And I'm like, honestly, you should probably like go to trade school and become a plumber and like own a plumbing. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh you my should, god! I'm sure. I'm sure your mom loved. I'm sure your mom, you'd love that you were giving yeah. that advice to your brother. I'm like, you should become a plumber, and then you know, you should like buy a plumbing business and scale that to like you know a hundred different locations and become like a hundred millionaire. Um, but I think directionally, this is where I, where I want to be. I want to be on record saying fewer people go 
into college, more people go into trade school, and I think it's a positive thing for the incomes of those individuals and for the for the country holistically. That's a juicy one, man. I like that. I like that prediction. I think I think it's definitely you know coming to a head now with all of the stuff that we've seen in the news lately with you know Harvard and Penn and so on. Um, I think part of it could could be catalyzed by a kind of a regime change in what are the biggest companies in the world and what are the companies that pay the most money in the world. You know, when when you think about you know, the careers that existed in the last like 50 years, 100 years that were the most lucrative, um, where were they hiring from? And what will that look like over the next 50 years? Like if you get, if you need to get a job at OpenAI or any of these, you know, new uh, emerging AI companies or tech companies, like are they going to be hiring from universities or is it better for them to hire folks who are just like kind of the hacker mindset and coders from a young age? Um, you know, like where, where are people going to be hiring from? Like as a company, would we be comfortable hiring someone, uh, who, who doesn't have the traditional background? I think for us, the answer is yes, but you know, just broadly speaking, uh, if that door opens up, then I think people would love to get out of this system of, you know, incurring a massive amount of student debt, uh, you know, going through an absurd process in high school to try to get into these schools. And then you get there and the grades are inflated. You're taking on a massive amount of debt the curriculums are kind of absurd <laughs> in, in some ways and the way they right. manifest and, you know, the way that the things that people learn don't seem to be, you know, very reasonable views of the world. Like, I think people are hungry for, for another avenue. And especially now that remote work has become so prevalent and the global talent pool has expanded, like if there's an ability to hire people from other countries who certainly don't have access to the universities that we have here, but could acquire the same skills that are needed on the job in different ways. I think that, you know, that push is coming and that push is much needed. So I'm, I'm a big fan of this prediction. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I would handicap the probability of it occurring in 2024, but I think over a long period of time, I'd love to see this one come true. Yeah, I don't know what like the right data point would be for it in 2024, but I, I, I think like when I look at the creator economy, and sort of the emergence of the creator economy, what that what I think was emblematic of was just uh, a desire to be entrepreneurial and to not have to work at a nine to five job that you hate just in order to be able to make ends meet. And it's very clear that millennials and Gen Z just do not subscribe to the same sort of ideologies that our parents did about you get a job at a company and like work sucks and you stay at that company for you know, 30, 40 years you know, you either put money into your 401k or if you're lucky enough to work at a company that provides a pension, like you do your 20 years, then you get your pension. That's just out. And the problem with the creator economy is that it's really difficult to be a creator. I mean, like there, I think like 95% of uh, creators that are out there make less than $13,000 a year. So on one hand, there's just a supply demand imbalance. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's a there's a tremendous amount of opportunity that exists in doing the sort of like not sexy jobs, right? Like we talked about Uber and them getting into sort of the task rabbit oriented business and like that being kind of the next wave of, of gig economy. So people that are not necessarily just driving Uber, but they're showing up to your house to provide some sort of like uh, at home service. And I think people that, that want to like have a very high probability uh, way of being able to make a lot of money are going to be able to do that very easily in the future if you have a skill. And the great thing about developing that skill is that it can be done relatively easily and relatively cheaply. You know, like if you look at the cost of college, I don't know what the average is, but I'm sure it's like close to $100,000 to go to like a four-year college, whereas most trade schools are like, you know, in the neighborhood of 10000 So you can go to trade school for, you know, a year or two years, you can develop a trade, you can develop a skill. And if you are entrepreneurial, if you are business-minded, it doesn't mean that you just have to like, you know, be a carpenter or be a plumber. You can be a business person, but with that skill set, and you can grow a very large organization. Right. And I think that's just going to continue uh, to, you know, to manifest itself into, uh, into various opportunities in the future. I think the other, the other thing that comes to mind as we're talking about this, like how many times have you spoken to your friends and you've had this conversation about, yeah, I don't use any of the skills I learned in college on the job. Like yeah. nothing, there's not a single thing that I do and I have done over the 10 plus years I've been in the, in the job market that has been provided to me by my university. Like right. I didn't learn very much outside of, you know, 
extracurricular Party. activities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, when I was when I was in college, and I guess you know you could say that's a that's a valuable skill in you know business development or whatever. Man, you can you can you can draw the bridge if you want. But the end at the end of the day, like none of the none of the stuff you learn in college is what you actually do on the job. Like how much better could I have been at any craft? had I started at the age of 18 and was just like working under people or I don't, I don't know if you want to call it an apprenticeship or something yeah. else, but like actually learning the skills that are directly applicable to what you're going to be doing as opposed to sitting there and reading books and getting lectured and falling asleep in class and all that other stuff. Yeah. And I, th I think there was like for a long time, you know, America became great because we, we built stuff here, right? Like from the industrial revolution through world war two, like there was a ton of people who were blue collar in America and they were proud of it like even you know motor city and detroit and like building cars and all that stuff and at some point in time it became like i guess socially unacceptable or people got um embarrassed of saying that they were blue collar because there was such a focus on materialism and you know trying to make an incredible amount of money and those jobs were considered to be sort of like the i don't know like less attractive jobs from like a social st stigma standpoint um and that to me feels like it's it's shifting like I don't think that people so much care not necessarily I think America is still definitely incredibly materialistic but I don't think that people <laughs> care as much about like how you make your money you know what I mean it's not like the same sort of prestige that was um, given to people that were like lawyers or doctors you know like every parent was like so proud to say like oh my kid's a lawyer or a doctor like as long as your son or daughter is making a lot of money doing whatever, like I wouldn't be embarrassed. If my son was a plumber and he was like making a million dollars a year being a plumber, he owns an incredibly successful plumbing business. And like, that would be, I'd be more than happy to say that, you know what I mean? And I feel like that's just a, a thing that's been shifting a little bit, but maybe that's just me. I think there's also just more of an emphasis on other parts of life, at least in the right. post COVID era, it seems that people are emphasizing work-life balance, spending time with your kids, prioritizing your health. And maybe I'm just like in the LA bubble where everyone yeah. talks about health all day. But like, I do think as I, even as I talk to my friends who are still on the East coast and so on, like, I think there's just kind of a, a shift in what people are valuing. And with that comes the opportunity to pursue other careers that in the past haven't seemed as attractive. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a plumber, even if you don't run the plumbing, if you run the plumbing business, that's awesome because you're yeah. going to be rich. But even <laughs> if you were just a plumber, I think the the values that you're providing, like it's it's unclear to me what the value of a lot of stuff is, even if it's a cool company. Like, yeah. do we need another payment processor? Do we need another social media app? Do we need another AI headshot generator? Like, it might sound cool to say that you're like an engineer or you work at one of those places, but like. I don't know, helping Google optimize their ability to extract ad dollars out of people is probably a less, I don't want to say honorable, but it just doesn't seem like that the value you're creating there is commensurate with what you're getting paid relative right. to other careers that exist out there. Like when I first started working in New York, you know, I met a ton of people who were in like, let's say PR or something like that, where they basically worked for free. So like they would graduate from college and then they would work at some PR agency for basically minimum minimum wage, which didn't even cover like their daily commute on the subway and what they had to, they had to buy their own lunch and all the rest of that stuff. So you're basically working for free, which just meant that you had to have your lifestyle subsidized by your parents. But they were like so proud to say like, oh, I work at this PR agency and we represent whatever A-list celebrity. And I... I just don't feel that out of the younger generation today. Like they don't, they don't care to say like, oh, I work at Condé Nast. Like that doesn't provide enough social clout for them to accept a job where they don't get paid enough money to be able to eat. You know what I mean? Like I'd much rather be the person who figures out how to make six figures a year working gig economy jobs. And it's like, yeah, this is this is what I do. And I also you know, bought a house at 25 and like I own my car and I can vacation and, you know, I can have kids or whatever, as opposed to like selling your soul to some company that's not going to pay you very much money just so you can say that you have a cool job like that. That to me is out. Um, For sure. All right. So the next prediction, VC headcount gets rocked. I've seen these headlines that have started to pop up. Um, I looked at Crunchbase. 38% of VC funds that are registered on Crunchbase did zero deals in 2023. 
So what is this indicative of? There are a large amount, when I say a large amount, thousands of zombie VC funds. And what we had was we had the recession that happened in technology starting in 2022. And, you know, we came out of it in, in 2023 um, and startup headcount got rocked. A lot of startups have gone out of business. A lot of startups will go out of business. But one thing that we haven't seen is that sort of uh, correction work its way into the actual VC industry. And the dirty secret about venture capital is that VC itself does not scale. So what do I mean by that? VC needs to be a niche asset class because you cannot reasonably be expected to deploy hundreds of billions of dollars into small startups and expect and expect uh, you know double digit like I think twenty percent IRR returns right like that that cannot happen. Whereas it can happen in public equities because the market caps are large enough to absorb it. For example, if you ran a $100 billion fund, you could put it all into Apple and like you wouldn't move the price of Apple because it's a $3 trillion company or whatever. So this is gonna start to work its way into venture. I think venture capital headcount gets reduced substantially in 2024. I think the number of venture funds uh, goes down materially in 2024. And this is kind of the final phase of the uh, of the recession that started within the startup ecosystem in 2022 so that we can then get to the place where there's fewer venture funds, there's fewer venture capitals, uh, capitalists, there's uh, uh, less number of deals that are getting done, but the deals that are getting done are higher quality moving into uh, the later part of 2024 and, and beyond. I love this one, man. You These last two, these last two have been fire. I think <laughs> When I look, when I think about like venture capital, and look, we've taken on venture capital. It's it's not like every firm is the same, but when I just look at the way this industry has evolved, um, it's just become way different than I think the original idea of it was meant to be. You weren't meant to have these 23, 24, 25 year old kids coming in who have no idea how to actually help your company grow and the only value add is the dollar they bring to the table and that by nature is going to be commoditized because there's no difference between your dollar and my dollar except if I give you more dollars and like that isn't that isn't a way to help companies grow uh, that isn't a very smart way to underwrite investments yeah. um, so I'm, I'm happy to see kind of a, a return to normalcy on that um, because the bottom line is when you're a young company, when you're a startup, you're a series A, C, series B, whatever, like, you know, you don't just need money. Of course, money is a big part of it. It'll help you hire. It'll help you do research and development. But you need guidance. You need people who are going to stick by you during tough times. You need people who are going to connect you to potential customers, to potential employees who are going to help you understand the market cycle because they've been through it before. Someone who has no experience building a company, doesn't even have experience investing, to be frank, cannot help you do that. And because of that, you know, venture returns have suffered. Uh, you know, if you kind of really take an extended view, then venture return suffering affects the institutional investor returns who have over allocated to VC over the last, you know, 10 years or so. So I think I think this is a really interesting one because you don't really hear about this like the, it's all over the headlines when, you know, Brex lays off a thousand people or yeah. Google lays off a thousand people or any company lays off. But I don't <laughs> I never see the headlines about the uh, VC firms laying off people. I think it happens in a much quieter way. Uh, maybe they move you to like an operating partner role on but you don't actually get paid for that or something or like they do it in a, in a way where it's not as visible. But I think this is this is much needed because if you have less headcount, uh, you, you don't have to raise as large funds to support uh, your firm and provide those returns to the GP. So I think this this would provide a much needed boost to to the VC ecosystem and, you know, by extension, startups in general. Yeah, I mean, you just had a huge one that did make the headlines, which was open view. And I was just looking at like how big their uh, their last raise was. But I mean, like this is a company, a firm that had raised hundreds of millions of dollars and yeah, so they were, they're dissolving a $570 million fund, right? And I think this is just like the beginning of a, a large number of firms who are gonna do the same thing. And one of the biggest issues that I see in the ecosystem is the high water marks for, for most of these VC funds will never be achieved again. So just how, like real briefly on how that works, like, once you have a high watermark, you can't fee your performance until you exceed that again. And 
given where the high water marks in 2021, it just literally doesn't make sense to try to climb out of that hole because you could have multiple years of like 20, 30, 40, even 50% returns that are just working your way back to the high water mark as opposed to shutting down the fund, putting a new banner out there and then generating that same 30, 40, 50% return and taking 20% of it and carry. So that it like just from the from the GP perspective, it just makes more sense to scrap it and start over than to try to climb out. But one of the bigger issues is a massive under deployment of capital in 2022 and 2023. So you don't get fired as a capital allocator typically for doing deals in 2020 and 2021 at, at valuations that were too high. Why? Because like you exist within a larger portfolio and the expectation is that you don't drift from the mandate. So like if I'm if I'm the Saudi investment authority and I've given, you know, XYZ venture capital fund a billion dollars to manage, my my expectation is that they go out and they make investments, they do deals. And in 2020 and 2021 they were doing deals at valuations that were too high, but in 2022 and 2023 what did we see? The industry retrenched and deals went to, you know, a very very low level, which means that the opportunities are going to be missed. The same startups that were trying to raise capital down 50, 60, 70, 90% in 2022 and 2023 are going to be raising capital at flat to up in 2024 and 2025 because the business is in a better place than when they raised capital in 2020 and 2021. That's the function of just like when the market got hot, you know, you could raise a lot of capital more than you needed. So like your operating runway was, let's call it, 24 to 36 months instead of like 18 months, which means that the revenues are going to be materially better than they were when you last raised and, and the valuations are going to be higher. And VCs just missed out on that. So when they go to raise their next fund, their LPs are going to say, look, we, we totally get it. 2020 and 2021 disastrous vintages, but to miss the opportunities that existed in 2022 and 23 is kind of unforgivable. And then where did we see the most dollars go in? It went into venture it went into ai and venture capital so those were the hottest deals at the biggest valuations which are unlikely to provide like the 100x returns that you need and and that's the reason why i think you know we're just going to see a, a material shrinking of of the space in in 24. i think i think an extension of that um prediction which i'd like to put out there is that this next crop of investors call it like the 2020 class and beyond are going to be much better investors than the previous class, which was like kind of the 2010 to 2020. I think the experience of seeing the market really tank during COVID and the gyrations we've seen and the volatility we've seen over the last few years, coupled with the fact that you can really, in a short duration, see the AI hype cycle come and potentially go next year, the crypto hype cycle really reach kind of you know, an insane level and then come crashing down, like un getting an understanding of market cycles more broadly and also kind of these hype cycles that exist within certain pockets of technology or venture. It's really an informative experience that I think was missing from the investing education of the previous class of investors who, as I mentioned earlier on, like you could have just been a completely passive investor and killed it over the last 10 years. And yeah. you might have mistaken your luck for skill. And I think that's not going to be possible over the next 10 years or, or at least the next five years where if you're going to make money in markets, it's going to be because you were good at it, not yeah. because you randomly allocated to a bunch of random shit that was supported by low rates and VC hype. Like, I think this next crop of investors, though smaller, because, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of these guys are going to be let go. I think they're going to be much more successful and better investors. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I came into the, I started trading professionally in 2008. So, so, you know, it was trial by fire, commodity trading, um, you know, so through the great financial crisis and then through the ZERP era from the time I graduated college in, in 2010, you know, through, I guess, 2022, saw the ups and downs of multiple different market shocks throughout that period of time and then COVID and then now seeing interest rates go up 500 basis points and like, it, it, it just is a really good education in what to do uh, with regard to situational awareness. You know, like you see these different things happening, you start to understand 
uh, the behavior of certain asset classes given expectations or given things that are happening on the macro level. And if you don't see it, it's really difficult to, to predict. And once you do see it, you know, it just becomes one of those things that you know how to deal with it. You're able to much more accurately price the risk. Um, and I think this is, it's a tough lesson to learn, especially when, you know, you came into an industry that was, it seemed like it could only go up and to the right, but, um, I totally agree. I think it'll make you make them better investors and that's good for, that's good not only for the firms, but it's good for the people that are allocating dollars into VC moving forward. Um, all right. Last, uh, prediction I have kind of, uh, kind of one that, you know, is, is close to home for us here. Uh, alt media officially becomes mainstream media. So I've been looking on, uh, you know, X, previously Twitter, I'm, I'm on Rumble. Like, I just think that the mainstream media has never been in a worse place, whether it's CNBC, CNN, Fox, like it doesn't feel, it, it, it almost feels like that space is a caricature of what it once was, where it's almost like a joke in and of itself. And I see the people that are leaving just doing so much better. And I want to call out Tucker Carlson. So I'll be fully transparent. When he was on Fox, I thought I hated Tucker Carlson because he was on Fox. And like, I just politically don't align with like the Fox sort of, you know, the average Fox viewer, like I'm not that guy, right? So like I would see Tucker Carlson clips and I'd be like, who is this donkey? But now he's been doing his show. I think he's on episode like 50 something or whatever of his, of his X show. Um, and I've been watching it the last few weeks and then he was on the all in pod and like, I've just been so impressed about when he sort of sheds that corporate veneer and can just be Tucker without sort of fear of, uh, you know, the reprisals that come from your corporate overlords, um, how entertaining that is. And like, when you can just get to the topics that people want to talk about, like newsflash, like people want to talk about UFOs. I'm sorry. Like they do, you know, like, I was going to, I was going <laughs> to ask you about this. I was going to ask you, have you seen, what do you, what do you think of this? Uh, these, these very vague and, and kind of ominous, uh, statements he's been making about the UFOs and aliens lately. I don't know, but I'm interested. You know what I mean? Like, like for, for people. And, and I think like the rest of America is like genuinely interested. If you have guys that claim to have worked in like secret government programs working on like alien technology. Like, dude, I want to hear about that. Like that's more of me, you know what I mean? Like let's have, like, let's talk about that for hours. It's like super fun. So <laughs> I, I think like, you know, those type of platforms that, that give uh, the whistleblowers and, and, you know, people that are, that are um, developing shows that continue, that were considered to be alt shows, like a, a, a voice are going to do really, really well. And that's why I really hope that, Elon Musk figures out the advertising dilemma on X because I do think that that is kind of like the last social media platform that really is is genuinely supportive of free speech and this will probably get us banned for this episode which would be annoying but like you don't get you just don't have that same freedom on on YouTube like I'm sorry you don't like there's a lot of things that we want to say on here that we intentionally edit out of the show because it goes against policies that we're not even read into, right? So that continues to work. Rumble, which is a publicly traded stock, um, you know, they have shows that that people that get kicked off of YouTube go over to Rumble, and and those those shows are are thriving. Um, so I think more people that are currently like mainstream media folks leave to go and do podcasts, and that they do them on X or Twitter and on Rumble, um, and like that just becomes from a viewership perspective. Uh, a far higher uh, rated viewership than what we see in, in typical cable television. I haven't personally watched Fox News, CNBC, CNN, any of these like mainstream media channels in many years. I've never even considered watching it. And I would say most of the people I know are in the same boat. Or if they watch it, it's by accident or because they think it's funny or it's maybe it's just one of those times like during the election time, I think people tune into kind of the more traditional media outlets, but yeah. outside of like big events like that, it's very rare. And it is a caricature. I think that was a perfect description. Like you go there because you know everything they're going to say is so tilted. It's such bullshit. And you go it just to like hear, you go there just to hear that. So, you know, I, obviously amongst older demographics, I'm sure, you know, they're not completely dead yet, but you know, as the next generation becomes kind of, you know, taking, taking hold in, politics and in finance and in business and so on. Like, I think it's very obvious that 
other forms of media are much more trusted. There's just been a erratic, like a, just a dissolving of trust. Like totally. you don't really believe what you see unless it's coming from, you know, straight from the horse's mouth. I feel like, like when I listen to a podcast and I hear Tucker speaking the way that he actually wants to, there's no, he's not worried about Pfizer paying the ad dollars exactly. to Fox and he has to say something like just, and, and hearing people talk about that in such clear terms, which are things that, you know, many people suspected for many years, but now you actually just hear it like straight up, like, yes, we could not say X, Y, Z because X, Y, Z sponsored the show or because X, Y, Z was the biggest, uh, ad, uh, ad revenue generator for the company. Like it just does a lot to bring down the level of trust. And when I see pod, like I saw Tucker on the all in podcast, that's really like the first time I've ever even watched him. I never even considered watching him before. Um, and I was like, okay, this guy is not what I thought he was. And I've had that experience with many people on podcasts. I think podcasts are like such a good form forum for people to like really express who they are outside of all, (laughs) all of these other, uh, considerations. So I totally agree on this one. Like, I don't know, uh, what platforms will end up being the most successful over the long term, but certainly right now it seems like X, uh, X is up there as a way to really get unfiltered information in yeah. real time. And I think with the addition of Grok, uh, you know, this is uh, XAI's uh, AI chat GPT competitor that Elon is launching. Like, I think that's really going to enhance the, uh, the utility there. So uh, definitely, definitely bullish on this one. And, and you also are starting to see it from the people who would be the most coveted guests on like traditional cable news shows. Like for example, uh, Jeff Bezos just did Lex Friedman. Yes. Podcast. It's the first time that he sat down for a long form interview in like over 10 years. So previously when Bezos was doing this, like it would, it would be unthinkable for him to do a podcast, like certainly a podcast. He would definitely go to like 60 minutes or something akin to 60 minutes. And it would be like a very corporate thing where he'd be walking through the Amazon, you know, warehouse and like basically it was a commercial for whatever he was doing, right? And to see Jeff Bezos, who's now no longer at, at Amazon, but still is a executive chairman there, and now you know I think officially running Blue Origin or whatever, most of his time is spent at Blue Origin. To him to choose Lex Friedman as the the venue and the platform that he was going to give a, a two and a half hour interview to, it, that tells me everything I need to know. Like here's a person who uh, their PR team could get you on. He probably turns down a hundred requests a month for people that want to interview him for whatever. And he's like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go on to the Lex Friedman show and I'm going to talk about Blue Origin and I'm going to talk about you know my workout routines and my time at Amazon and business advice because that is, is going to get, his message is going to get to the people that he actually wants to get the message to as opposed to the viewers of 60 Minutes, right? So more and more people are going to do that. Did you, did you see that episode, by the way? I did. did I you, thought it was fantastic. Did you watch the Bezos one? I thought it was great. And it was Bezos awesome. is another guy who... I think there's a lot of like, you know, Jeff Bezos quotes out there, but I hadn't really seen, it was the first time I'd certainly listened to an interview that was anywhere close to that long, you know? So it it was for me, like, I feel like I walked away with a new appreciation for, for who he is. You know, I watched a terrible movie that just came out on, it was like this low budget movie that they did. Um, and I feel like, oh, okay, I learned a little bit about him. But this was the first time where I, I walked away saying, like, I feel like I know Jeff Bezos a lot better than him. Yeah, you know. and I think the, the, cool thing about, the cool thing about this interview was I think Bezos is one of those guys, because he has not made a ton of, like, appearances and kind of done these long-form interviews, the public perception of him has really changed. Like, when you take a step back and think about Jeff Bezos, he is probably the greatest businessman ever. Yeah. <laughs> like he is the number like think about what he did with Amazon and starting from a bookstore surviving the, the dot com boom and bust and like creating this company that in any industry if you hear that Amazon is coming everyone starts shaking in their boots because they yeah. know that when these guys come in like you're done <laughs> and the public perception of him has just kind of been skewed and twisted in recent years obviously he went through uh, the, a very public divorce but like the there's all these like memes about him and just like basically he's kind of turned into the butt of many jokes in recent years and I think doing something like this and like just hearing him speak so eloquently and hearing a little bit about his childhood and his background it really like brings 
you know, revitalizes the appreciation for someone like him. And that's so powerful when, you know, if you let other people control your narrative, uh, it can go in all kinds of directions. So I thought I thought that was an awesome episode. Like I think you know whoever's listening to this show should should check that one out as well. For sure. All right. Well, more of that in uh, in 2024. All right. Any uh, any final words before we go to the final trade? In 2024, the AI hype will die down and the bubble will get burst. Long that. I think that happens. Open AI in 2024 will no longer be the leader of AI. Short that, I think that open AI stays the leader in the AI space. Sustainability and climate resistance is going to emerge as an even bigger theme in 2024. Long that, and obviously long the sustainability theme on Atlas, of course. The 2024 election and who is in the White House will not impact stock returns in 2024 and 2025. Short that, who's in the White House is going to make a huge determination on stock returns. Who that is, though, I don't know. It's a tough one. Papa Powell will not survive 2024 as the Fed chairman. Long that. That's definitely true. I mean, he's got the job until he's got the job until whoever's sworn in on January of 2025 is sworn in. But it's not going to be a Democrat. So Papa Powell's out. All right, man. So that was a lot of fun. Congratulations on a spectacular 2023. Really, just been a pleasure working with you, doing the show trading with you looking forward to a prosperous 2024 hope that you have a, a good week with the family happy new year's and uh we'll kick this show back off in uh the early part of jan absolutely man you too and you know happy holidays to you kim and the rest of the fam uh and and rain of course so looking forward to 2024 i think we got some cool things in the works obviously with the company but also on the content side man i think it's gonna be a good one awesome dude all right, guys, thank you so much for watching this week's episode of the Atlas Pod. Please make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Shaval and I are wrapping up this year. We'll see you next year with another episode.